This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, episode 13, How to Read Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, part 2. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is part 2 of the novel Don Quixote. And coincidentally enough, part two in a series of open book episodes on Miguel de Cervantes' novel, his 1615 sequel to the 1605 runaway bestseller about a bored country gentleman who dresses up like a medieval chivalric knight and wanders the Spanish countryside in search of adventure. At the end of part one, Quixote returned to his home in La Mancha, where his friends, the priest and the barber, left him in the care of his niece and his housekeeper, though there were hints of more adventures to come. As in our last outing with Don Quixote, we're not accompanying him through every last adventure he experiences in part two. Of its 74 chapters, we're reading just nine and its prologue, namely the opening four chapters in which Don Quixote and Sancho reunite, after learning that part one has been published and is widely admired, they depart for more adventures, explicitly to give authors like Cervantes more to write about. Then we're reading chapter 16, in which Quixote advises a father to let his son study poetry. And we're concluding with the last four chapters, 71 to 74, in which Quixote returns to his village, repudiates romances makes his will, and dies peacefully. Part two of Don Quixote is different from part one. In part two, for instance, the characters are a lot more self-conscious of their reputations. They are like characters who know they are in a novel, who are surrounded by readers of their earlier adventures. This part two is the definitive version of Don Quixote's adventures. That's the reason that Cervantes has him die at the end, in order that no more tales can be told of him. Cervantes explicitly forecloses unauthorized sequels. And his reason for that is because, as I said in the last podcast about Don Quixote Part 1, between 1605 and 1615, the dates of publication between Part 1 and Part 2, a pirated, unauthorized continuation of Don Quixote Part 1 had been written, published, and circulated. And you can tell that this really irritated Cervantes. Not only because his hero had been adopted and taken over for all these unauthorized adventures, but also because he had given the world Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and he felt naturally a sense of a possessiveness about them. He felt he rightfully ought to be the one and only person to continue their adventures, which is why he has, in fact, Quixote and Sancho actually encounter and repudiate the unauthorized continuation here in part two. The prologue to part two is really concerned with, among other things, discrediting this false book of Don Quixote's adventures in the Edith Grossman translation, which we're using throughout these podcasts. On page 455 to 56, Cervantes writes of Quote, another Don Quixote who has traveled the world in the disguise of a second part. The author of this unauthorized continuation was Alonso Fernandez de Avellaneda of Torcedillas. At least I think that's how you say it. And in a chapter that we're not reading, chapter 59, Don Quixote and Sancho actually meet people at an inn who have read both the true part one and are in the middle of reading the false Part 2, that's on pages 845 through 49 of this edition, our heroes actually read it, pick it up, read it, and criticize it for, among other things, its inaccuracies, its indignities, its, its false stories, like it 
pronounces, for instance, that Don Quixote falls out of love with his beloved Dulcinea. They call Avellaneda a false historian. They, they refute his description, for instance, of Don Quixote jousting at a place called Zaragoza by, in fact, refusing themselves to go to Zaragoza, which is exactly where they were headed when they stopped at this inn. Instead, they say they will go to the jousts at Barcelona. So they're trying, in other words, to change history that is the history that gets falsely told by changing their actions, changing their intentions. The false part two is actually going to make a few more appearances in this true part two. There's a moment when they appear or rather go to a printing house while they're in Barcelona and proofs are being corrected of the reprint, or rather the printing, of this, this false continuation. Don Quixote asks them to destroy it because he says it's untrue. There are so many wonderful paradoxes in an encounter like that, and in every, all of these encounters with the false part two. Cervantes loves this paradox, this paradox of fictional characters who are repudiating a fictional text. It's a question of degrees of fictionality, of degrees of truth. Avellaneda's story is fictional only if we accept that Cervantes part one is true. But of course, they're both fictions. In fact, they are equally fictional. One is simply viewed as just less valid because it's derivative, because it's not authorized, literally authorized by the original author. And yet Cervantes himself also takes pains, as we've seen in part one, to stress his own derivative status. He talks about all of his work with the translations of the the Arabic source, the true source that he in fact is using himself. So he's merely a translator. The effect of all of these paradoxes is to undermine familiar categories for us, categories like truth and fiction and history and romance. But enough about all that. Let's get to the beginning of part two and chapter one and talk about what has actually happened. At the end of, end of part one, Don Quixote has returned to his village for rest and recovery, but it's not for very long. He talks with his friends, the priest and the barber, and they have conversations, uh, for instance, about the necessity of knights errant. For instance, the, the custom of knights gathering at the court of the king. In this case, it's because the king of Spain is facing a, a, a f possible foreign invasion. On page 460, it was thought certain that the Turk would come down with a powerful fleet, but no one knew his plans or where the huge cloud would burst. This fear, which has us on the alert almost every year, this is the priest speaking, had now affected all of Christendom, and his majesty had fortified the coasts of Naples and Sicily and the island of Malta. Quixote then steps in, and again, we are outside of the realm of history and in the realm of romance. At the beginning of a romance, a king who's facing a problem like this of a foreign invasion would gather all of his knights in order to seek counsel, to send them away on quests, and that's in a romance. But of course, that's where we're, we're actually living in history, but Quixote imagines what a king might do if we were living in a romance on 461. Quixote says, what else can his majesty do but command by public proclamation that on a specific day all the knights errant wandering through Spain are to gather at court, and even if no more than half a dozen were to come, there might be one among them who could by himself destroy all the power of the Turk. This is, of course, what they could do if they did exist. If there were only one, well, guess what? There is only the one. There's only this deluded knight, this deluded man, Don Quixote himself wandering through Spain, reenacting a romantic role that doesn't exist anymore. On 464 to 465, continuing on with the second part, chapter one, Quixote speaks in praise of their, their customs, their habits, their virtues in this age, this decadent age, which has declined from their ideals. The bottom of 464, 
He describes himself as, I only devote myself to making the world understand its error in not restoring that happiest of times when the order of knight's errantry was in flower. But our decadent age does not deserve to enjoy the good that was enjoyed in the days when knights errant took it as their responsibility to bear on their own shoulders the defense of kingdoms, the protection of damsels, the safeguarding of orphans and wards, the punishment of the proud, and the rewarding of the humble. So it's clear, if nothing else, that Don Quixote still very much believes in the necessity and the goodness and the merits of knights errant. In uh, chapter two, we have the arrival of Sancho Panza, who is aggrieved that uh, Don Quixote has made him a false promise of an insula, which is a sort of island uh, that he can rule over as its ruler, that he will be given this in exchange. He had been promised to be given this in exchange for following Don Quixote the whole time and enduring all this suffering. Sancho says, he lured me out of my house with tricks and lies, promising me, promising me an insula that I'm still waiting for. Quixote is sympathetic. He says on 470, it grieves me, Sancho, that you have said and still say that I lured you away. Knowing that I did not remain in my own house, we went out together. We left together and we traveled together. Together we shared a single fortune and a single fate. But they quickly move that along from that controversy, and Don Quixote asks Sancho about his own reputation, what people, as he says it, uh, what people are saying about me in the village on 471. What opinion of me do the commoners have, and the gentlefolk, and the knights? What do they say about my valor, my deeds, and my courtesy? What is the talk with regard to my undertaking to revive and bring back to the world the forgotten order of chivalry? Sancho confirms that people do indeed think that Don Quixote is mad, but he tells him then about the publication of part one. He has met with the son of a friend, Bartolome Carrasco's son, who's been studying at Salamanca on 472. He came home with his bachelor's degree, and I went to welcome him home, and he told me that the history of your grace is already in books, and it's called The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, and he says that in it they mention me, Sancho Panza, by name, and my lady Dulcinea of Toboso, and other things that happened when we were alone, so that I have crossed myself in fear at how the historian who wrote them could have known about them. They both marvel at this, not only that the book knows all sorts of intimate details that they could not have disclosed to anyone else, but also that it has come, come out so quickly. The beginning of chapter 3, uh, Don Quixote could not persuade himself, this is on 473, that such a history existed, for the blood of the enemies he had slain was not yet dry on the blade of his sword, and his chivalric exploits were already in print? Even so, he imagined that some wise man, either a friend or an enemy, by the arts of enchantment, had printed them. Cervantes subtly praising himself there. The book is very much admired by this bachelor, Carrasco, who enters in chapter 3 on 474 to praise Don Quixote as a very famous knight-errant, although Cervantes is not entirely sure that Carrasco may not be mocking him. He says to Quixote, Your grace is one of the most famous knights errant that there ever was or will be anywhere on this round earth. Blessings on Cide Hemete Benengeli, who wrote the history of your great deeds, and double blessings on the inquisitive man, Cervantes himself, who had it translated from Arabic into our vernacular Castilian for the universal entertainment of all people. Entertainment is a curious word choice. He does not say, say, edification or instruction. He says entertainment. Carrasco then describes the book on 475. The Moor in his language and the Christian in his were careful to depict very vividly the gallantry of your grace, your great courage in confronting danger, your patience in adversity, your forbearance in the face of misfortunes and wounds, the virtue and modesty of the platonic love of your grace and my lady, Doña Dulcinea of Toboso. And one of the things that's most admired about it, this is Cervantes sort of praising 
himself, not sort of, directly <laughs> praising himself, uh, is the way that it feels so accessible to anyone who reads it. Look at 478. Sanson, this is the uh, bachelor Carrasco, says, it is so clear that there is nothing in it to cause difficulty. He's describing how accessible, how widely read, how admired it is. He goes on, children look at it, youths read it, men understand it, the old celebrate it, and in short, it is so popular and so widely read and so well known by every kind of person that as soon as people see a skinny old nag, they say, there goes a Rosinante. And those who have been fondest of reading it are the pages. There's no Lord's antechamber where one does not find a copy of Don Quixote. As soon as it is put down, it is picked up again. Some rush at it and others ask for it. In short, this history is the most enjoyable and least harmful entertainment ever seen, because nowhere in it can one find even the semblance of an untruthful word or a less than Catholic thought. Readers of Part 1 have been taking that reading very seriously and encouraging more adventures, says Carrasco to Don Quixote. And that's not dissimilar to the way that Quixote has been reading his own romances. That is to say, reading something in order to imitate it, in order to enact more of the same of it. And so accordingly now, we have this reflexive way that they are doing it uh, of their own of their own volition, having heard about the readership of their own story, they undertake to head out for more adventures so that Cide Hemete Benengeli can write, can write them. This is on uh, 482, for instance, Sancho says, my master and I will give him such an abundance of adventure and so many different deeds that he'll be able to write not just a second part, but a hundred more parts. What can I say? What I, sorry, what I can say is that if my master would take my advice, we'd already be out in those fields righting wrongs and undoing injustices, which is the habit and custom of good knights errant. And so they set off so that part two may be written and read. So in the ensuing chapters, there are all manner of different adventures. Some go poorly, some go well. At the beginning of chapter 16, which is on page 550 of Edith Grossman's translation, Quixote is feeling that if things go well, then, quote, he would not envy the greatest good fortune that ever was achieved or could be achieved by the most fortunate knight errant of past times. In other words, he, in some ways, if he is able to succeed in his quest, which is in fact to disenchant Dulcinea, his beloved lady whom he believes to have been enchanted, that he is going to fulfill his quest. He's going to fulfill his quest also in a way that is satisfying to him in a comparative way. That That is to say, just as good as any quest he's ever read. Now, chapter 16 is different, though. Chapter 16 is not an adventure. It's, in fact, an interlude between adventures. It's a discussion of poetry, the occasion for this discussion is a stranger who, whose name is Don Diego de Miranda, and they run into him on the road. At the bottom of 551, he's described first. He's a very well-off, a very rich stranger. They were overtaken by a man riding behind them on the same road, mounted on a very beautiful dapple mare, wearing a coat of fine green cloth trimmed with tawny velvet, and a cap made of the same velvet. The mare's trappings in the rustic style, and with a short stirrup, were also purple and green. He wore a Moorish scimitar hanging from a wide green and gold sword belt, and his half-boots matched his sword belt. His spurs were not gilt, but touched with a green varnish, so glossy and polished that, since they matched the rest of his clothing, they looked better than if they had been made of pure gold." The man is immediately intrigued and perplexed by Quixote's appearance, and Quixote on 553 describes himself at length. He says, I left my home, mortgaged my estate, left behind my comfort, 
and threw myself into the arms of fortune so that she may carry me wherever she chooses. I have desired to revive a long-dead knight errantry. And for many days, stumbling here, falling there, dropping down in one place and standing up in another, I have fulfilled a good part of my desire, helping widows, protecting maidens, favoring married women, orphans, and wards, which is the proper and natural work of knights errant. Because of my many worthy Christian deeds, I have deserved to be published in almost all or most of the nations of the world. 30,000 copies of my history have been printed, and 30,000 thousand times more are on their way to being printed if heaven does not intervene. Briefly, then, to summarize everything in a few words, or in only one, I say that I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, also known as the Knight of the Sorrowful Face. Miranda, also called the Gentleman in the Green Coat, or the Man in Green, variously, is astonished at this, particularly because he is astonished that someone like Don Quixote believes, is, is, is credulous of the truth of romances. We've seen this controversy before. We saw it at the beginning of part one, and it has recurred again and again with people asking, interrogating Quixote, how can you believe in the truth of these things? Look at the bottom of 553. It happens now again, by the way. It happens in a slightly different way each time. How is it possible, Miranda says, how is it possible that there are knights errant in the world today, or that there are printed histories of true knightly deeds? I can't convince myself that anyone in the world today favors widows, protects maidens, honors married women, and helps orphans. And I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it in your grace with my own eyes. Heaven be praised with the history that your grace says has been published about your lofty and true chivalric feats. The countless tales of imaginary knights errant will be forgotten, for they have filled the world harming good customs and damaging and discrediting good histories. The difference, of course, is that Quixote is real. Quixote is a good history. He is not a false romance. He is not imaginary. But now it is time, as is customary in these conversations, for the man in the green coat, or the man in green, Don Diego de Miranda, to tell his story. And so he does, starting on 554. Uh, the, effectively, the problem that he is facing is that he has a son that he does not know how to advise. I have a son, he says, who is enthralled with poetry, if that can be called knowledge. This is on 555. If that can be called knowledge, that I can't make him show any enthusiasm for law, which I would like him to study, or for the queen of all study, which is theology. This is, let it be said, sort of an invented problem, kind of a, an excuse, you might say, for Cervantes to insert into Quixote's mouth the ideas that he wishes to express. And there are moments like this that can feel a little bit artificial. Uh, the speech that Quixote makes in response can sometimes feel like it's inserted into its invented occasion. And it's in some ways, another instance of Quixote surprising other people with his intelligence in particular matters like this, like in the proper education of children to allow them to pursue their own talents, uh, but madness in other matters. The uh, endorsement that Quixote gives to the father is for children simply to follow their virtue or rather to develop their talents in order to pursue virtue. 557, he says, You should allow your son to walk the path to which his star calls him. If he is the good student, he should be. And if he has already successfully climbed the first essential step, which is languages, with them he will on his own mount to the summit of human letters, which are so admirable in a gentleman with his cape and sword, and adorn honor and ennoble him. The issue, he goes on, is that the poet has to be a virtuous person himself. He needs to live virtuously. He should not be writing libels and satires and other sorts of vicious, negative kinds of writing further down the page. If the poet is chaste in his habits, 
he will be chaste in his verses as well. The pen is the tongue of the soul. These observations, as I said, are quite wise, quite interesting, quite learned, quite astonishing, frankly, that they come out of a man that the gentleman in the green coat on 558 says is looks like a, a simpleton. He changes his mind about him instantly. He's, he's impressed by what he calls uh, Don Quixote's intelligence and good sense. But no sooner does all this come out of Quixote's mouth than, than Sancho distracts him with and pulls him away to their next adventure. And the episode with the, the gentleman in the green coat is over just as quickly as it began. Finally, we come to the conclusion of part two, chapters 71 to 74, which has a very different, very somber tone, a tone of resignation, a tone of finality, a tone too that sees Quixote really looking ahead to his legacy, to his afterlife. For example, on page 923, he anticipates himself being represented in tapestries and being told and recounted in the future. And yet that's also something we've seen before. We really feel like, I feel like Don Quixote changes in these final chapters. His judgment seems sounder, it seems better. He has been very recently defeated. Uh, and he has an encounter with a man named Don Alvaro Tarfe on, in chapter 72, who has actually encountered two men who are going about Spain falsely claiming themselves to be Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Tarfe, whom we learn about, or we encounter on page 924, is actually a character in Avellaneda's false Don Quixote, the, the unauthorized continuation. And they ha now, Quixote, the real Quixote and the real Sancho, encounter him and say to him, I think beyond any doubt, your grace must be the Don Alvaro Tarfe, whose name appears in the second part of the history of Don Quixote of La Mancha, recently published and brought into the light of the world by a modern author. I am, responded the gentleman, and Don Quixote, the principal subject of this history, was a great friend of mine. He then mentions that he took this false Quixote to the jousts, as I mentioned, at Zaragoza, and Quixote, the real Quixote, asks, Can your grace tell me if I resemble in any way the Don Quixote you've mentioned? No, responded the guest, certainly not at all. This is just too much for Sancho not to step in and say something. On top of 926, he says, The real Don Quixote of La Mancha, the one who's famous, valiant, intelligent, and enamored, the writer of wrongs, the defender of wards and orphans, the protector of widows, a lady killer with maidens, the one whose only lady is the peerless Dulcinea of Toboso, he is this gentleman here present, my master. Every other Don Quixote and any other Sancho Panza are a trick and a dream. And this is where we learn the way that Don Quixote and Sancho Panza have deliberately undermined the false history. Further down the page on 926, I want your grace to know, Señor Don Alvaro Tarfe, that in all the days of my life I have never been in Zaragoza. Rather, because I had been told that this imaginary Don Quixote had gone to the jousts there, I refused to enter the city, thereby revealing the lie to everyone. Instead, I went directly to Barcelona. A bit further on, he says, In short, Señor Don Alvaro Tarfe, I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, the same one who is on the lips of fame, and not that unfortunate man who has wanted to usurp my name and bring honor to himself with my thoughts. Now, I did say earlier that frequently, not infrequently anyway, Cervantes likes to insert things into the mouth of Don Quixote that he himself wishes to say, that he would like to say in certain circumstances, and this has to be one of those moments. But it is the last of such moments in this novel. The closing chapters, see 73 and 74, see Quixote and Sancho return to their village, 
of La Mancha, they begin to talk about Quixote's new plan or desire to, as he puts it on 931, become a shepherd for a year and spend his time in the solitude of the countryside and devote himself to the virtuous pastoral occupation. He would like to take this up now. And I think there are two reasons for Cervantes inserting that in the penultimate chapter, the second to last chapter. Part one of them is to suggest that uh, Don Quixote will be constantly wandering, constantly, well, not constantly wandering, constantly searching, that is, for something, for something to follow, for a new ideal to enact, to live in his life. And he is just on the verge of this new one, which may or may not be serious, when the beginning of chapter 74 the life of Don Quixote had no privilege from heaven to stop its natural course and reached its end and conclusion when he least expected it. This is the chapter in which Don Quixote dies. But not before he repudiates romances entirely. It's a bit of a, well, you might call it a deathbed conversion, because that's exactly what it is. Look at 935. Quixote says, My judgment is restored, free and clear of the dark shadows of ignorance imposed on it by my grievous and constant reading of detestable books of chivalry. I now recognize their absurdities and deceptions, and my sole regret is that this realization has come so late. It does not leave me time to compensate by reading other books that can be a light to the soul. And so he continues, Further on, good news, senores, I am no longer Don Quixote of La Mancha, but Alonso Quiano. Once called the good because of my virtuous life, now I am the emedy, enemy of Amadis of Gaul and all the infinite horde of his lineage. Amadis being the Spanish chivalric knight that Quixote so admired earlier on. Now all the profane histories of knight errantry are hateful, to me. Now I recognize my foolishness and the danger I was in because I read them. Now, by God's mercy, I have learned from my experience and I despise them. We might ask ourselves at a moment like this, why Don Quixote repudiates romances so readily, so categorically, and whether or not we're convinced. I think that might be the wrong question. I think that is to treat this as a sort of realist moment, a real moment, which it isn't. It's the end of an enormous, sprawling, episodic novel. It's also very much Cervantes trying to foreclose additional continuations. So part of the reason that Quixote laments that he has been the occasion for this false part two, he says on page 938, is because Cervantes wishes to make sure that no one else can write a false part three. There will be no more continuations because here is the definitive author of the definitive version killing his hero. We can ask ourselves now, too, whether or not the, the end of this novel is satisfying. And I think that that is a curious question because the ending of a novel is not something that anyone has really done before. That is to say, if this is the first novel ever written, then this is the first moment when someone has to decide how novels properly end. And what makes, a, makes an ending novelistic is really for Cervantes to decide. We can recall the, the romance, the realist romance that uh, they spoke of earlier in part one, Tyrant Le Blanc, in which the knights do very dull things like making wills the way that Don Quixote does uh, and dying in their beds the way that Don Quixote does. We want, I suppose, a more romantic ending, the more an ending that would be more typical of a romance in which, say, Don Quixote would 
ride off with Dulcinea and be happily ever after with her, or whether he might die heroically in a battle. But ultimately, Cervantes is saying with this conclusion that novels end the way that life ends, at moments when you don't expect it, and in ways that sometimes can allow you to be graceful and decisive and true. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is about seven poems by the 17th century metaphysical poet John Donne. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliott. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. 